Okay, good morning. It's good to be back. Did you notice I was gone, Richard? Not really. Well. <laughs> oh, you had some, so you liked the, the change, huh? You had some good speakers uh, we did, we did. for a change. No, that's good. Dan Lee was here. Jerry, Jerry did a good job on Wednesday. Yeah. Great, great, great. I'm saying anything, but if you want, you all remember what we got. Ah, uh, yeah. Kim keeps it on her speed dial, or on her favorites. Uh, well, we were, we were in, okay, a few little fun introductory things here, if you bear with me like usual. Since we were out of town, I want to catch you up on everything. Um, we were back home in western New York. My sister's court date has been postponed. I mentioned that Wednesday night. Uh, many of you are also in the class on Wednesday night, but not all of you. So I'll have to be going back up to New York again. Uh, in a few months, it looks like. But uh, it, we were able to bring her home and uh, so she can get some things done. So Kim and I came back, but I'm glad we were there at the time that we were. It's absolutely beautiful in western New York right now. And if you saw my Facebook, I had some. Can you get the lights for me? Because this will look spectacular with the low lights. Um, this was near the church building where I used to preach in Niagara Falls, New York at the LaSalle Church of Christ and I pulled over. Kim had to put up with me pulling over now and then and taking a lot of pictures. But that tree, it's like God was arresting my attention and saying, Tyler, look over here. Look at my majesty and praise my name. And that's how I feel when I see something just pop like that and stand out that way. Um, this, uh, so we went up to Niagara Falls and um, we, of course we used to live there so we've been there many many times and have taken a lot of visitors with us to see the falls uh, and this is the little little sliver of the Niagara River where it splits around an island before it goes a little further in, uh, over the falls so you can't really see the raging rapids here it's just a little quiet spot but this is right behind my mom's house when you walk outside um, this is the grounds of her apartment buildings right there. Just uh, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, my wife insisted I put a picture of her up here. So um, she's, she's just very self-centered and wants all the attention. Oh wait, no, that's her husband. I'm sorry, yeah. No, that, uh, so we were only on the American side down here. How many of you have been to the falls? How many, how many have ever been to Niagara Falls? A few? I can see a few hands in the, in the dark here. Uh, wait, let me get the, down over here, this is the Canadian side over here. That's Canada. This is the gorge, the Niagara Gorge that separates the two. And then the Horseshoe Falls, the iconic horseshoe shaped falls is way there in the distance. We didn't go over to Canada. They changed it after 9-11 where you had to have a passport and then during COVID it was restricted and now I think it's open where all you need is a driver's license to go over. But while we were up there, look at this. And look at, it just uh, makes you want to praise God for his glory. God thought of making trees do this. Right? Those, those maples. Yeah, those are, there's a lot of maples up there. Of course, that's the symbol for Canada for the Canadians, I mean the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs, but I, I really uh, was fascinated with these. I uh, hadn't seen any quite like that before. All right, um, well, it was absolutely uh, glorious. We had a good day that where we could, after worship, we were able to go up there. It was raining most of the rest of the time we were there. All right, one other thing I want to share with you. Thank you, Anna. We can bring the lights up. Did anyone have uh, donuts and coffee this morning? No, I guess we should have brought some. Uh, has anyone ever heard of uh, Tim Hortons? Yes. All right. Yeah. Huge in Canada and on border states, right? Oh, you have? Okay, have good. Aha, uh -huh. see? See, so you know Tim Hortons, right? They're ubiquitous. You think Star Starbucks is everywhere? When you go up there and you get close to the Canadian border, you can't swing a, a, a dead cat. No, no animals were injured in the use of that illustration, okay? You can hardly go uh, a few hundred yards without running into a, to a Tim Hortons. Well, they have these little donut holes. Have you ever had the Tim bits? Okay, those, uh, 
in more recent years, they started these little Timbits. So they're little tiny, happy uh, donut holes, uh, just so moist and delicious. So when we get home, we have a box of Timbits for the first few mornings. You get up with your coffee. There's all different kinds. There's cinnamon and chocolate and chocolate sour cream and uh, blueberry and birthday cake with sprinkles. You open the box and it floods the room with happiness and, uh, and it soothes your soul. It's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. So I know I posted about this. Some of you might have seen it on Facebook. So we finished those off after a couple of days. And then uh, someone went and got another box. So I get my coffee. I head over to the box and I open it up. And I, all I see is this. <laughs> and I look inside and I, I was absolutely bewildered. How could anyone get a box of all plain or just regular glaze? I, it crushed my spirit. I just, um, I started crying silently and walked away in a spirit of disbelief. I just, I could not believe those, those kind, the, those in the plain cake ones are made with, um, 90% sadness and 10% disappointment. That's why they taste <laughs> the way they do. I, I posted about all that. Some of you might have seen that, having fun with that. So, um, uh, so I made sure I went back and got some more Timbits before we left um, of, the, of the really happy ones. That, uh, okay, wait a minute. Yes, ma'am. So I want to know if you showed them our, our mandolier for some palm trees up there. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I'm going to have to wait till the next class. You know, I'm going to put it on the video, though. While I was up there, I texted a couple of those pictures of the leaves, of the trees, to the elders. And uh, Erwin replied, yeah, just like down here. <laughs> and I replied, yeah, just like Houston. And I sent a picture of this cluster of hideous palm trees to him. So I wish I could pull that up and show you. So we were joking about that very thing. But I don't know if you noticed something else uh, today, Rose, but... Um, we were eating pizza and wings last Sunday evening while Josh Allen and uh, my Buffalo Bills uh, beat your cute little quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs. Wasn't that sad? Oh yeah, well no, he's still cute though. All right, yeah, yeah. Yes, he's a likable guy. Um, all right, yeah, if he gets ugly, if he's not, does, I think he's going to stay nice and um, he's going he's gonna to continue to be the nice guy that he is. And uh, Josh Allen, the Bills quarterback, he's on everything, uh, boxes of cereal, uh, uh, barbecue sauce, salad dressing, every sign and shirt and everywhere. He's a rock star up there, just like Mahomes is, like, your, your cute little guy um, is as well. So anyway, that, I wanted to make sure you saw my new cup. All right, well, I can tell you're impressed. We still have a little bit of time before we dismiss for Bible study. So let's, um, <clears throat> sorry, sorry, thanks for indulging me. This usually happens when I come back from a trip. I'm sorry, you're very patient with me. You're very indulgent. I appreciate that. Let's, uh, can you see me with your shades on, Bono? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Got the indoor sunglasses on. It looks cool. You know, I wish I could pull that off. Well, let's go to our, our Holy Father, ask for his blessings on us as we go to his word. Our great God in heaven, hallowed be your name, Lord. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we praise you and we ask for your blessings on us as we go to your word. Father, we stand in awe of your majesty as we look at the creation around us, as, uh, as we experience the change of seasons, as we go through our days, we continue to be amazed with each passing day at your greatness and your glory that you've displayed all around us, but especially that you've revealed to us in your Son and in his love and in the love of your Son and the hearts of your people. Lord, we see, we see that glory and we see that power. We see the wonder of Christ in the cross uh, as we live in community as his disciples, Father, and we know you're transforming us by that 
that wonderful love and ask that you continue to do so and ask you bless, that you bless us in our study of this uh, great letter that you had Paul write by the Holy Spirit for us. And bless our children, our teachers in their classes, Lord, our, and our worship this day that you might truly be exalted, that we might all be edified. May your grace be on your faithful servants throughout the world today, and especially those who are enduring persecution and hostility and, uh, and who are in great need, Lord. Uh, we ask for your mercy for them. And Father, we pray that your will be done in us and in all things and unto you, O God, and unto your Son, who reigns at your right hand, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> okay. So here, let's, uh, let's catch up with where we were. Uh, as we continue, this will be, Lord willing, I'm looking at the clock trying to make this the last class, so four classes of introduction for 1 Corinthians, but uh, I've found it very enriching. I hope it isn't too much for you to go through all these preliminary things, but I think it really makes our study of the letter much more meaningful, and, uh, and it makes the study a, a, a richer one when we look at the circumstances under which it was written and understand, for example, we looked at it at length, we examine the geography and the culture of Corinth, and uh, we looked at the, the social relations. We broke down some of those cultural issues from uh, into social relations and then the religious influences. I'm not going to rehearse all of that. We looked at the purpose, or we might say purposes, for which Paul wrote, and we gave a summary statement, and then I sort of teased it out and expanded on it with um, several ways that, that we can break that down, and I hope that's useful for you. All that uh, information is available in these files that you're seeing, all the information on the screen at the link in the description for, for the video. Those who are joining us, welcome to you. Um, and so where we left off, we were looking at the themes and theology of, of the book. And we said, uh, unlike Romans and, say, Galatians or some of Paul's other letters, he's dealing with problems that he's heard about in the church there. So uh, he's not so much developing a single theme. We see numerous topics, but there are some key themes that I want to set before you and focus in on. And we, we talked about, I'm just going to go through these just so people can see them who maybe didn't see the last class or maybe you weren't here for the last class. But we talked about how Paul applies theology and especially here our thinking about, about the cross and Jesus' sacrificial death on our behalf. He, uh, he, he applies that as you read through the letter. And I was really overwhelmed with this in reading through the letter a couple times in one sitting. It really will come, uh, come out at you. It will really sort of jump off the page at you as you see Paul doing this again and again, uh, showing how even though the letter is very practical and he's dealing with very concrete issues, he is shaping the way they approach those issues with these with what he's telling them about who God is and what God has done in Christ. So I gave uh, several, several examples of that cross-centered thinking, Christ-centered thinking. Remember, cruciform in our thinking. So we looked at, for example, uh, how he brought to mind the holiness of God when he was talking about the divisions in Corinth and how they ought to strive for unity and um, about sexual purity the use of spiritual gifts. Again, I know I'm just showing you what we looked at. I'm not going back through all of that. And even with the head covering, a very practical problem, very specific to the church there, but tremendous principles for our own understanding about, our, um, about the choices that we need to make and the influence that we have and how we relate to culture, but all starting with how we think about uh, that in light of who God is. So, all right, that's, that's where we left off. So, the, looking further at some themes in theology, that was just to show you how the theology, a few examples of how Paul is using theology. We're all theologians. That just means 
our thinking about God, the way we think about God, how he's using that to address these very practical problems. And that's what we need to do in the church. When the elders are discussing issues, when we're working through issues, through uh, conflict in the church, when we're considering, uh, when we're studying scripture and trying to apply it to our own situation and what we're going to do as a congregation and, and, and the trends that we're facing in the culture and in the church, we need to constantly be thinking about, uh, well, how, how, how is this to be understood in light of who God is, in light of knowing God? and uh, how God has revealed himself to us. And so um, that's, what we, that's why we were doing all of that. But now here, there are others you could list as well, but here are uh, just a few, like a four, that I'm gonna give you uh, of major themes because Paul keeps shifting topics according to what he's heard, according to the problems that are there. He goes to one thing after another after another, but we do see some emphases that really uh, are given <clears throat> uh, a great deal of ten attention. And early in the letter, we see Paul contrasting worldly wisdom with the wisdom of God. This is something you're going to hear me say. I've already said it over and over in these introductory lessons, but you're going to hear me talk about it again and again because we have the same problem today where so many in the church, people who identify as Christian, their thinking is shaped more by the world. You, you've heard me say this probably ad nauseum, but uh, you can repeat it in your sleep. But shaped more by culture than by Christ, by, more by society than by scripture. And so the, the, the thinking of the world, that's the, the worldly wisdom, and he contrasts that with the wisdom of, of God and how vain, how void, uh, the, the world is, how ignorant the world is of God's true knowledge. And this, uh, th this is something we'll be talking about as we think about the, uh, the, the Christian worldview and how so many have had their thinking in the church corrupted by the secular worldview and the values and virtues, so-called virtues of, of the age rather than the wisdom of God. So that's going to be important. We'll see. Um, and especially, uh, he'll uh, talk about that wisdom being manifested in the cross. Well, of course, Paul talks about Jesus and his suffering and his death on our behalf in, in, in one way or another in all of his letters. But in a very dramatic, a very powerful way, it's uniquely emphasized in 1 Corinthians that that we're holding forth a message that the world, think of Paul's time. It's easy for us to think of the cross as something beautiful, something lovely, that Jesus would sacrifice himself for us, to think that God would dwell among us and be willing to bear the punishment for our sins. Because that seems so beautiful and natural to us because we're so conditioned by it. Western culture has been shaped by Christian values. And there was at one time a shared cultural inheritance in, where the Bible had tremendous uh, influence and sway even in public policy and in our institutions. And so we, we're living in a time when we're very churched, we're very conditioned by uh, the cross and we look at it as a symbol that, of, of love and sacrifice and beauty. But in, at this time, this was a shocking and repulsive thing. It was a, an offensive thing to the Jews that their Messiah, our, our, our coming king, would be humiliated and tortured to death. Unthinkable. And the world just thought it was nonsense. You Christians have a God. You have a Savior. You're saying that I need to believe in this man who was crucified, as, who died like we treat common criminals. And you're telling me this is the one through whom God is saving us, through whom God has re revealed himself to us. So he shows that <clears throat> as much as the world thinks of it as foolishness or finds it offensive, it's actually the power and wisdom of God. And so what you and I know and what we hold dear, the truths of the gospel, <clears throat> the fundamental truths of salvation, we know the world thinks what, what we believe is ridiculous. We'll talk more about that later, the, or, or foolishness. But we know, uh, thankfully, because of the revelation of God, we, we have the, uh, the, the wisdom of God, and we, we can see things clearly and truthfully as they really are. There's so much to 
think about and, and contrasting the biblical worldview and a cross-centered worldview, Christ-centered worldview with the way that um, the, the pagans of antiquity thought and the way the pagans of modernity of our day think, the new neo-paganism that has come to supplant Christianity in so many places now in our day in Western culture and that is corrupting the church. But the cross also, remember we said, is not just where God, uh, where God in Christ suffered for our sins, but it's also a model that Paul appeals to for, for ethics, for the, that, that we're to conform ourselves to what to the, the self-sacrifice that Christ made on the cross is to be the kind of spirit that governs us, that we're imitating him when we are selfless, when we love as he loved, as, when we look at the cross and we see what true love is demonstrated by Jesus, and then that becomes the model for, for us in everything that we do. So let me give you some examples how this comes out in the letter. When you, when you think about how Paul brings up the death, remember we said he's taking these theological themes and he's applying them to all these different problems. So let's, let's do it here with with the cross, okay? Early in the letter, when he's addressing factions, what does he say? Was, was Paul crucified for you? See, some were, Paul is using himself and Apollos as examples. Not that they were actually leading factions there, but he says some of you are saying, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos. Was Paul crucified for you? No, see, he, he, he appeals to the death of Christ. Jesus is the one who was crucified for you. Well, what does that mean then? That means you shouldn't be dividing up and giving your allegiance to mere men or teachers. Christ is our Lord. Christ is the one who was crucified for you. When he talks about the fornicator in chapter 5, who uh, they, they were priding themselves in their tolerant. Boy, talk about something that applies to what's going on in the world today. They were priding themselves in how tolerant they were of this gross sexual immorality. And he mentions Christ, the, the purity we ought to have. And he brings leaven to mind, the corrupting influence of leaven and the imagery of the Passover. He said, for Christ is our Passover. He's our Passover. He's the one who was sacrificed for us, so let's purge out the leaven. See, he brings to mind the death of Christ. When, when, there were, uh, when he's dealing with the fact that they were suing each other over trivial matters, not that you can never go to court with another Christian, but uh, over the smallest of matters, I think, is the key there when you, when you look at it in context. But he says, why not rather take the wrong? Why not rather be defrauded I mean, that's what Jesus did on the cross. He suffered unjustly, but he didn't insist on his rights at all costs. Now, there is a time when we do need to insist on our rights. In fact, a lot of religious organizations, Christian legal foundations have gone to court for our free speech rights, our freedom of religion rights, to, and we're, we're grateful for that. But again, in this pers these petty personal conflicts and the jockeying for control and position and all of that, he brings to mind that we, you know, we should be willing to suffer wrong just like Christ did rather than divide the body of Christ. So um, when he talks about, of course, sexual purity, what does he say? I know my OCD, I got to keep playing with these to line them up right. When he talks about um, the problem of fornication and he said, you were bought with a price. Why should I keep my body pure? Because Jesus, when he died on the cross, he purchased me and I belong to him. Look at the price that God paid to buy me, to redeem me, to purchase me. So he brings that to mind, talking about sexual immorality. He says the same thing when he talks about marriage issues in chapter 7. You were bought with a price. When he talks about uh, eating meat, whether you can eat meat sacrificed to idols and the, the influence this would have on a brother. And he said, if you're disregarding the, the, the influence of your conduct on your brother, he said, w would you sin against your brother for who? He's not just your brother. He says, your brother for whom Christ died. Oh, see, that changes. The cross changes the way I think about you. You're a person for whom Jesus 
died on the cross, that means I should be treating you with the same kind of value that God places on you. How do I know how God values you? He gave his son to die on the cross for you. So you see how that shapes the way we should be thinking about these issues. Of course, the Lord's Supper, he brings to mind, obviously, the death of Christ. It's a memorial of his suffering and death. Even when he's talking about their selfish use of spiritual gifts in a way that was disruptive and not conducive to, to edifying. In the middle of that is the great chapter on love. That's what the, cro the cross is, the demonstration of the, the love of, of God. And Paul sets out the characteristics of genuine love, and it's, it doesn't seek its own. It's selfless, right? When he deals with, in, the, in chapter 15, the resurrection, great chapter on the resurrection, very powerful. Of course, he, he brings to mind how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and then he tells us uh, he was raised. And then, that, that, then he goes into the resurrection there. But So you see again and again and throughout the letter how the cross shapes ethics, right? Isn't that, I think that's powerful. I think that's beautiful, and uh, it's transformative. Another thing we'll see him comment on, again, it's not like Romans where he takes a theme like this and just develops it at length and builds on what he said in the last chapter and then explains more of what he's talking about. But you see it uh, sort of sprinkled throughout the letter, mentioned again and again. And that is the, uh, the coming judgment, the return of Christ. We should be living in view of our accountability to God and looking forward to the consummation of all things when Jesus returns. And that should shape how I live. Let me give some examples of that. All right, I hope these uh, are helpful. Really, I've got a few here where he mentions the day of the Lord um, or some kind of similar language or reference. That first one really should be chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. He mentions it in verses 7 and 8. But look at, again, when he brings up the factions that were the divisions in the church there early on in the letter, he brings to mind uh, the... Uh, the, the coming age and to view things in perspective, in that perspective. That's, that's a little bit of a complicated passage and it's not so explicitly referring to it. I'm, I'm not gonna explain it right now, but we'll look at it. When he brought, brings up disciplining that brother who's, you're tolerating this brother who's flagrantly, persistently engaging in this gross immorality and he said, you need to deliver him to Satan, why, why? that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. See, that man's going to stand before Jesus one day, and so are you for how you're responding to this problem. But there's a coming day, the day of the Lord Jesus, right? Uh, about these lawsuits, he says, don't you know we're going to judge angels one day? And he brings to mind... Uh, that, that eternal perspective. What does that mean? It's one of the difficult and intriguing passages in the letter. I'm not going into it right now. Uh, are you impressed, Richard, with the tremendous restraint I'm showing? Okay, so far, so far, but he's skeptical wh 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 how much we'll get through. So, so the sexual immorality, again, he brings to mind um, that uh, when he talks about our bodies, he said, now this is, this is beautiful too. I'm overusing that word this morning. So interesting. That's my other uh, word I overuse all the time. But it, it's powerful because he says, now, your body is not for fornication. It's for the Lord. And the same God who raised up the Lord is going to raise up your body. What you do in your body matters. It's not just to gratify any desire wantonly. But he said, and, and part of the, his emphasis of the significance of your body is not only is it a temple where the Holy Spirit dwells, God's going to raise it from the dead one day. You're going to have that body forever. It's going to be transformed, he says in chapter 15, into a glorified, immortal, it's going to put on immortality. It's going to be changed. But there's a continuity with the body that you have now that we'll talk about when we get there. Uh, when he talks about marriage, he brings to mind the time is short. Paul was writing as though, uh, and we should live this way, of course, as though Christ were to return. The imminent return of Christ, I said on the title for this section, for this point uh, on that last slide, that uh, th this urgency and expectation that Jesus is coming now in our lifetime, and we need to be living that way, 
with that reality. But he's writing to the church there. Like he says, the time is short. The time is short. He's talking about the present distress and he's recommending it may be better for some of you not to marry, given what you're facing right now. And he, and he talks about the end of all things, he says, is at hand. So that should shape how you think about these questions you asked me about marriage. See how the theology comes into play in all of these things. Again, the idol meet. He talks, he brings into view uh, the, the, the coming judgment, gives warnings uh, about that. Chapter 10, let him that thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. He, he uses the Israelites as a warning. When it comes to the Lord's Supper, what does he say? We hear that text almost weekly in chapter 11 about the Lord's Supper, but he said, you're, you're showing the Lord's death until he comes. So he's not developing an elaborate, uh, a systematic theology of what's going to happen at the parousia, the coming of Christ, but he keeps bringing it to mind about everything you do. If you're thinking about the coming of Jesus. We're doing this until Jesus comes. We're expecting him to come. And we're going to do it with him. And we are doing it with him. We're going to do it in his presence. And then, and then uh, he says, and you know, some of you are sick because you're not doing this right. Some of you are sick and a few of you sleep. I, and I think he means spiritually, uh, although uh, I'm not sure, but I lean toward that view. But again, that's the idea of our, our accountability uh, toward God. And when he talks about the spiritual gifts, chapter 13, the great chapter on love, that um, he speaks of when the perfect comes. And now, now I know in part, then I'll, be, then I'll know perfectly even as I'm known. Ah, very difficult and intriguing passage in certain ways. And the letter ends, Maranatha, with this exclamation. What does that mean? Come, Lord, come, or come quickly. Right, it's an appeal for Jesus to come. And then because Paul deals with it at such length, in one of the more complex, one of the more challenging and one of the most thrilling texts in all the Bible, 1 Corinthians 15, he deals with the resurrection of the body. So I'm listing that as a theme because he really does. This, this is a subject in this place where he elaborates uh, at length about the coming, the coming resurrection. So we'll look at that there, but that's chapter 15. We should all know that, be familiar with that. That's the great resurrection chapter. Where is that in the Bible? 1 Corinthians 15, right? And then, of course, I, I just listed those four. There are numerous other topics and themes that are addressed individually as you as you go through the letter. Um, I'm trying to get the color that I want. Yes, that makes me happy right there. Um, you'll see as you go chapter by chapter, look at all the things that Paul addresses here. What, what am I dealing with? I'm saying here are some of the key themes. Here's some of the key theology in the letter. But remember we said this letter is unique in certain respects because uh, it's not so much developing a few uh, themes that are all connected and related, but he's dealing with topic, one topic after another after another. Well, what are those? All right, let's walk through the letter together right now. I don't know if you've ever done this before. We're about to walk through a whole letter. Are you ready? Is anyone, anyone still with me? This is a tough room. Is anyone still? We need that coffee in the, in the Timbits, Rose. Uh, perk everyone up. Any question or comment about any of this so far? Les? <laughs> anyway, I wish you guys could see what I'm looking at. Right. Looks like we're all ready for our nap this afternoon. I want to see you do this in 10 minutes. All right, ready? <laughs> First Corinthians. Start your timer. Ready? Yep. Okay. Chapters 1 through 4, Paul deals with uh, divisions in the church here. See, I got four chapters done right there. You impressed? Uh, no, really, that is, uh, we talk about him moving from topic to topic, but he continues to, to work through that in those first several chapters. So, um, so I'm, I'm putting those together there. In chapter 5, he deals with the fact that they were tolerating gross sexual immorality in, in their midst, right? That's the chapter where he talks about putting away that wicked man from among yourselves. In the beginning of chapter 6, that's where he deals with the lawsuits. We're already in chapter 6. Uh, he deals with uh, the brother going to law against brother. Oops, I didn't change my text there. Excuse me. That should be uh, chapter 6. So let's just slide that out. Um, 
he deals with a brother going to law against brother. But then in the latter part of the chapter, there's a shift. And I know there are ways that commentators will say, well, these are related. They're linked together this way. The way Paul segues, sometimes they see that, that he's addressing that now because it somehow relates to the previous. But really, they, they seem to be sort of standalone issues that he's addressing one after another. And this is where he's dealing with their own sexual purity and the use of the body, especially in light of the fact that some thought, well, it didn't really matter what you do with your body that it was perfectly acceptable just to satisfy whatever bodily cravings you have. Just like if you're hungry, you eat. Uh, and if you have an urge for uh, sexual fulfillment, you just go, go ahead and fulfill it. And Paul uh, stresses the ethic of the use of the body and of sexual purity and how your body belongs to the Lord. It's, it's tremendous stuff, right? Um, in chapter 7, then, he addresses a number of questions that they ask him about marriage. And that's a lengthy chapter, I suppose, given the length at which Paul deals with that, I could have listed that as something of a theme in the letter. But, but there it's sort of isolated to that, to that one section. But then we get to these three chapters where Paul is going through uh, the question of eating meat sacrificed to idols and the problem of idolatry and some of the practices, the cultural practices that were linked in people's minds to idolatry. And um, for example, getting meat in the marketplace that had been offered to idols or going to a feast where food is being served that had been offered to idols. And uh, is that right? Under what circumstances should we avoid that, et cetera? And Paul goes through that in chapters eight through 10, some tremendous principles there about showing the the same self-sacrificial love that Jesus did and being willing to forego certain things you may have a right to. Paul uses himself as an example. I, I, I could have uh, asked you, I could have compelled you to support me and to pay, pay for my work as I labored among you, but he said I was willing to give up that right because I didn't want it to be a stumbling block to you. And he, so he uses himself as an example and uh, that's in chapter 9, but it's in that broader context, chapters 8 through 10, dealing with idolatry. And then in chapter 11, the beginning of the chapter is where he addresses that issue of the woman and the head covering in public worship. That, that's a fascinating study. Also a very challenging text. But then at the, in the latter part of chapter 11... Uh, that's when we have the familiar text that we hear so often and we cite so often even at the Lord's table where Paul talks about their abuse of their assemblies and their meals together and the way they were treating each other, the, the ungodly way they were treating each other was coming out at the table, at the Lord's table, at their observance of the uh, remembrance of Christ's death. So chapters 12 through 14... Again, this, this could be a theme in itself because Paul deals with it in such detail and at length. Uh, he talks about the, he lists and he uh, elaborates upon the spiritual gifts and their proper use and God's design for them and their limitations and uh, addresses their abuse of them in, in some, at some length in chapters 12, 13, and 14. And that's where we get in chapter 13, in the middle of that, the beautiful chapter on love, right? That is one of the most familiar texts in all of literature, in all the world. First, that's in this letter, 1 Corinthians 13. It's one of the most beautiful things that ever written. Chapter 15, we already saw, right? What's chapter 15 about? If anyone was paying attention, someone might know from a minute ago. Ah, some of you were. Some of you were. So you weren't playing Scrabble on your phones after all. Uh, um, wasn't sure. Um, or you weren't texting each other like, can you believe Tyler's still doing introduction to First Corinthians? So chapter 16, with the usual closing and greetings and uh, other matters, he talks about the collection that he is taking up for the poor saints in Jerusalem in Judea and that he's uh, going, that he's taking up as he's going among the Gentile churches and he's encouraging them to put something aside for that. And in the second letter, in 2 Corinthians in chapters 8 and 9, he'll, he'll address that at length. 
All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I did that in another class as a little joke. I, I put my hand up like this and walked off camera like a mic drop thing. And none of you saw it probably, but I added in the final upload the sound of uh, uproarious applause. Uh, on it. I'll pull that up and play it for you. We'll do that here. We'll do that here as well. And, uh, it'll seem like there are thousands of people with that. Oh, but one other thing I really like to do, and all, all, all that we have left for introduction, so we can start the text next time, but. Um, uh, I do want to squeeze in. I can just put, put the information before you. I just want it there, though we don't need to look at it in detail. Some of the literary features. You know, I did that with the Gospels, and I, I've been doing it. When we went through the Pentateuch, I paused in the beginning of each one to say, look for these literary features, the way the text is written. God's not only speaking to us in what is being said, but how it's being said. The structure and the form is, is the means of communicating, and it's important to look at. We'll look at some of those literary features. But right here, I'd like to set before you some of the key passages, what I think are some of the key passages in the book. And I really would encourage you to, as we go through the book, to, to write down several of these or maybe other ones that stand out to you and commit them to memory. I was even thinking, well, maybe we should have uh, a, a test. You know, we won't make you get in front of the class when it's your turn and recite the memory verse. But uh, if we pass out a piece of paper, we used to have to do this in the school of preaching. You had to memorize all, all these verses, and then you, you had to sit there and write them all out so the, so the uh, teacher knew that you had done, done the memory work. But I thought it might help us if we knew we had some kind of accountability. If we knew we had, okay, oh, yeah, next week we're supposed to know this verse. So maybe I'll just orally quiz us, or maybe we'll have a written quiz, or I'm just still thinking about it if you're interested. But, you know, chapter 1 and verse 10 where Paul says, you know, I beseech you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And when talk, Paul talks about uh, the cross being the wisdom and the power of God, to look at chapter, this is an easy one to memorize, chapter 2, verse 2, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I'm going to be citing this in class today. Um, no, don't, don't you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither idolaters, nor adulterers, nor uh, fornicators, nor homosexuals. Nor, it, Paul goes on to say, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord and the spirit of our God. Um, chapter 10, 31 through 33, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. And then here's the other list. You've got to write those down quick, Richard. I'll leave that up. But, um, but you notice the ones I put in red? Those are the ones I'd really encourage you to have committed uh, to memory. And, um, you know, really, we, we, we could learn that whole section, uh, that, that, that whole text from 1 Corinthians 15, but uh, verses 50 through 58, one of the most thrilling and powerful texts in the Bible. But let me encourage you as you go through the book to make marks, mark in your Bible and let's put these words in our heart and let God, uh, let's saturate our spirits with this, these uh, great truths that the Lord is revealing to us. He's speaking to us. Lord, open our hearts to hear you as we study this letter. Thank you for your good attention. Sorry I don't have a big box or two or three of Timbits to pass around, but uh, maybe another, another class. We'd have to ship them down, I guess, though, from... We hadn't talked so much about football and, and Western New York and the leaves and Timbits and donuts. Uh, we, we might have fi finished the, all, the, all the introduction. Let's go, Buffalo.